finish the book yeah. uh, this afternoon. So you'll be all experts <laughs> in mass at the end of the class today. Well, let us uh, pray as we begin uh, together. And we'll pray. I'll pray this special prayer for St. Francis. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, by whose gift St. Francis was conformed to Christ in poverty and humility, grant that by walking in Francis' footsteps, we may follow your Son, and through joyful charity, come to be united with you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I know Father Joseph last week kind of took on the heart of the Mass, you know, the Eucharistic prayer, and I want to give you uh, an opportunity before we dive into the next section, if you have some questions or something that came to your mind after last week's class that you'd like me to touch on before we get into the new material today. I'm sure you did a fabulous job and answered every one of your questions and anything you could possibly think of, right? Yes, <laughs> Okay, great. That's, that's wonderful. Well, you know, I want to start with uh, a little thought about St. Francis of Assisi. You know, um, he had a great love uh, for the Mass and a great devotion to the Eucharist. You know, he started in a really wonderful experience when wanting to uh, rebuild the church. And he was in prayer one day and uh, speaking, he looked up and the Lord from the cross was speaking to him. And the Lord said to him, you know, rebuild my church. And that cross um, that he spoke from is still hanging in Assisi. It's in the Basilica of Santa Chiara, St. Clair, and you could visit that cross. It's you, in fact, it, that's a model of it right there. It's a cross that looks like that, the San Damiano cross. And so, what did he do? He st first started, he rebuilt the church he was in. Brick by brick, put it back together, straightened it out, new roof, fixed it all up. And then he realized that perhaps the Lord was saying something a little different to them rather than just being a building construction person, but rather looking at the church as the people of God and rebuilding the people of God in the image of Christ. And so he went about his entire life then ministering to his immediate group of little brothers that joined him and then St. Clair and the Port Clair sisters who joined of them as well. And those orders have grown. Sister, I don't even know how many thousands of people who are members of the Franciscan communities today in our world from just a little bunch of guys who wandered out of town to live a simple life and to pray. Now, St. Francis was never a priest. He was a deacon. You know, so he served the liturgy as a deacon. So he cared deeply about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So as we celebrate his feast day today, it's really a great thing for us to continue to dive into the parts of the Mass which are left for us um, to look at today from Father Phil's book. I want to pass around while we're doing this a little photograph. I can't remember um, which little section this particular mosaic spoken of. It's one of our sections today. And it's the mosaic when you're walking out of St. Peter's Basilica and you look up above the door. Father Phil talked about the that experience. Well, one of our classmates who now has a gold star and an extra credit. And, and she's done such a great job in finding a picture of that and bringing it in that she doesn't have to take the test at the end of the class. <laughs> Exempt from the test. But so you can see a little bit what that picture is. You can just pass that around uh, during class. So, Father Joseph left off at the end of the Our Father yesterday, or last week. So we've prayed the Eucharistic prayer. We have uh, prayed the prayer that the Lord taught us to pray. And uh, now we come to the sign of peace. Now this is a, a piece of the Mass which is, in, over time, has flexed a little bit. You know, there, are, there were certain time frames in the Mass when the, the rite of peace happened before the gifts were brought
brought to the altar. I think Father Joseph might have read a little account from St. Justin last week to you, describing what the Mass in the 100s. And if you listened carefully, you heard that the sign of peace happened before the gifts were brought to the altar. So you listened to the Word of God, then you made peace, and then you went to the liturgy of the Eucharist. Over time, uh, this, the sign of peace, has been, had been moved to where it is now in the Mass. But it's been multiple places. You know, sometimes it wasn't there at all. Sometimes it was before um, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And now it is before uh, we approach the Lord to receive Holy Communion. So that we can be at peace with one another before we meet the Lord personally in the Holy Eucharist. So that's why it is where it is today. And that rite of peace obviously is uh, simple, but nonetheless kind of packed with lots of, uh, of hope, but yet a lot of work. You know, peace is not always an easy thing in our world today. Just think about your own lives and your family, your friends, the, the political nature of the world today, countries at war with each other, and here we are, asking the Lord for peace and sharing that peace with one another. Uh, so what we do here, when we do things in the liturgy, you know, there's something about the liturgy that we say is timeless. It's as if what happens during the Mass doesn't have a time. The past and the present and the future during the Mass are all the same. You know, the liturgy is timeless. And so, when we, whatever we do in the Mass, when we pray it, when we make our gestures, when, when we listen, it's as if we're out of present time and connected to all that has gone on before and all that is going to go on in the future. And while we're, all of that comes together in this moment as we gather for the sacred liturgy. And so, it is with this peace as well. It's a bit of timelessness. You know, we could be in a terribly unpeaceful mood at that particular moment in our day when we come to Mass. Does that mean that we just, I'm not going to wish peace to anybody. <laughs> Past, present, and future come together at that moment. Our hope, our dream, the gift of God for this gift, wonderful gift of peace is ours. And we are the ones who unlock it. You know, in all the gifts that God gives us, he never forces any of us to do anything. He invites us, offers us, gives us gifts, and hopes and prays his keen desire is that we'll accept what he gives us and we'll use it in our lives. But he doesn't force us. The old free will coming back over and over again in our lives that he won't force us. But he hopes that what he gives will be a gift received and a gift used. And so in this moment of the rite of peace, we pray diligently, reminding all each other that this is what the Lord said. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Don't look on our sins, Lord. Look on the faith of the entire community, the church, and grant your peace and unity. And may that be always according to your will. So that's the intense prayer that we pray at that particular moment. Then we hear the words that Jesus said at the Last Supper. Peace be with you at the Easter events. When he came to visit the apostles, what was the first thing he said? Peace be with you. You know, so we hear that greeting, the greeting of Christ Himself, spoken by the priest who stands in the place of Christ at that moment and wishes that peace, that gift to all of us. And of course, we respond. And then there's an option. Um, if a, you know, the, the, going back to the red words in the book, you know, not the black words that we say, but the red words. <laughs> that tell us what to do, then, if appropriate, the deacon or the priest adds, let us offer each other the sign of peace. We 
always pray for peace constantly, always. But the gesture is if appropriate. Like for instance, during COVID, we didn't do that. It wasn't appropriate at that time. Uh, but now, of course, we're doing it again. No one says exactly what the gesture has to be. You know, in various countries, various customs take you know. If you're going particularly in an Asian culture, you, you might all get a bow to each other instead of a handshake or an embrace. Question back there. If the priest doesn't, like I was at church on Saturday at the visitation, and the oblate did not uh, say, you know, let right. us, do we just not do anything? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't think in the visitation monastery they do it. I mean, which is the custom of their order. Yeah. So. Actually, they do it all the time. What? It depends on the priest. Oh, does it? Yeah, they, the sisters do it all the time. Okay. <laughs> Do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, general. I didn't realize that because I knew that it's been a while since I've said mass there for a while. They weren't doing it, but okay. Yeah. I mean, you can always turn to each other. And, you know. It's not a social hour. That's the other thing. This is not a social moment. This is an intense desire for the spiritual gift of peace to be brought to each other. And what we do is symbolic. So you don't have to get everybody in the church. You know, you don't have to start wandering all over the place, you know, to, to make sure you got peace to everybody. You know, that's, you know, it's just to those who are around you. And uh, it is, again, it's not, it's just a simple gesture, whatever that gesture is. So it's not a time of okay, we're gonna we're gonna break solemnity for a few minutes and have a little social time. Let's chit chat about what's going on, and then you know the priest has to call us back when it's time to do the Lamb of God. No, it's not a social hour, but it's a it's a genuine offering of the spiritual gift of peace it comes from Christ to the people who are around you. Now I've already offered it, of course, to everybody in the church. You know I say it, and I say it to everybody. Always. So everyone is is offered that gift, but it's a way for everyone in the pew to participate in the sharing of that gift, which comes from Christ. So common, simple gesture, whatever is customary in your family, or uh, I think most people nod here or shake their hands or family member give a little kiss or whatever. So that's that's what this this particular moment in the Mass is to be this right peace. Questions about that? Good. All right. Then what happens next? We begin to work ourselves into the breaking of the bread. I want you to think about for a moment, though, the actions of Christ at the Last Supper. What did he do? He took the bread, so he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. So there are four actions that Christ did at the Last Supper. And if you think about the liturgy of the Eucharist at the Mass, there's a part of the liturgy of the Eucharist that does each of those actions. We take the bread and wine. It's presented at the presentation of gifts. We bless it. That's the Eucharistic prayer, the great prayer of thanksgiving and blessing. We break it. That's this particular rite in the Mass, the fraction rite or the breaking of the bread and pouring of the wine. And then we give it, the reception of Holy Communion. So we do the four actions of Christ during the Eucharistic prayer. And so th that's why this is not just a, oh, I got a I've got to get the, all the hosts and get them around the right number in each patent so we don't run out at each station. No, it's an action that Christ did. The breaking of the bread, and the distributing of the hosts to the different patents, that's all taking on the action of Christ. So it's something that, that's done in front of people. And we don't do it in the back room and get it all set up. No, the deacon brings the, the host from the tabernacle them in the patents. I break the host because remember it was Jesus broken body that brought us his salvation. I mean on the cross his body was literally broken and so is the bread literally broken and it's in that brokenness that Christ 
salvation. And that brokenness that he has made more present uh, in our midst. So that's why the breaking is so important. It's one of the actions of Christ. And we break the bread. You'll notice that the priest always takes a piece of it, puts it in the chalice, drops it in the chalice. The Father Smith told a nice, the good meaning and story behind that in the book about the, the tradition, how that started, was uh, in Rome, the Pope would have the mass, his large mass, and he would break the host and give a piece of the host to a deacon. The deacon would take that piece of host to the other major basilicas in the city of Rome. And when their mass took place, the deacon, at this particular moment in the mass, would bring the piece of host from the Pope's mass, and they would drop it in the chalice. So that the church is a sign of unity, that we are not alone in all of this, that we belong to a larger um, community. We belong to the universal church. Now, physically, we can't do that anymore. The Pope can't have Mass early in the morning and get a piece of the host every Mass that's going on in the world today like you could when the church was much smaller. But we still do this gesture to remind us of our connection and our unity with the rest of the churches of the world. So that broken piece dropped into the chalice. And we say these words. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. So, unity with the Pope and the bishops and all the church, Catholic churches of the world. And we pray that this will bring us eternal life, our reception, this connection, the mingling of the body and blood of Christ. Because we believe that Jesus is totally present, Christ is totally present in the bread and in the wine. Body, blood, soul, and divinity in both. So, you know, okay, we don't, since COVID we haven't had the blood of Christ, so I'm missing something. No, you're not. In the body of Christ is body, blood, soul, and divinity. In the blood of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So the completeness of Christ is in both elements. Uh, and this connection, the mingling of this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, bring eternal life to us who receive it. So you're not missing out. I'm only getting half a pride in Christ. I'm only getting his body. I'm not getting his blood. You know, that isn't what look at. We believe that the totality of Christ is in both. Like, for instance, I've been in Mass before, and we've run out of hosts. We had the precious blood, so people could receive the precious blood, and they were receiving body, blood, soul, and divinity. Most body, blood, soul, and divinity completeness. So I'm here to pop up. Under. Yeah. I uh, see. So when they start going to the bigger holes, there was a small one we used to use, and all of a sudden now we're using the big holes now too. Why well, it's always a choice. Okay. Um, one, oftentimes it decides on the size of your church because you have to be able to see it. So, you know, we have hosts that are this small, you know, for the, called an arch host, that the priests use at smaller masses, like daily masses. When we, um, our large Sunday mass, we use a larger host that breaks into more pieces, because my host then gets broken and placed in all of the bowls that are being used to distribute. Um, and so the people can see it. I mean, they make, uh, uh, there are places that, when you, if you go to a huge outdoor mass, you might see the Pope has one about like this because he's, he's, you got to see it from far away. You know, so there are various sizes. Okay, so we've dropped a piece of the body of Christ into the precious blood and then we begin to sing the Lamb of God. That beautiful image of Christ as a lamb goes all the way, of course, all the way back to the Old Testament. goes all the way back to the time when they took the blood of the lamb and put on the doorpost at the first original Passover. And so it was the blood of the lamb that saved the people. You know, the angel of death flew over the households that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. So who is the lamb 
blood of the lamb saved the firstborn? Who is the new lamb in the New Testament? Jesus Christ, whose blood saves us. So the same thing that happened for the Jews at Pat the original Passover happens for us every time we go to Mass together. It's that that saves us. And so we, we use this litany to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And then grant us peace. Father Phil does a beautiful job in this book. And a whole oratory about this particular the Lamb of God and, and Jesus and his serving as the Lamb. Want to see here? Yeah. I meant to say this at the end of the last section, but I found it beautiful that in the fractioning of the bread, this is where Father Phil mentioned you can go anywhere and understand everything, but really understand nothing. The universality of our celebration of Mass, he brought out in that fractioning of the bread. And as you said, and as Father Phil said, this is us. This is the little bit of us that's in every sacrifice. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's really interesting as we move into the communion rite how different experiences happen. I've been in masses of different places in the world. I know Father Phil told the story about being in St. Peter's Square. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you my, my St. Peter's Square story. I was uh, assisting Pope Benedict uh, on his first. Easter as the Pope. And so, um, there were, uh, I'm not sure how I got this role. Um, I think most of the priests leave on vacation in, in, in Rome, and some of us who Americans got, who were visiting got pulled into these jobs. Anyway, so assisting at uh, the altar and, uh, and then distributing communion in, uh, in St. Peter's Square. Um, it's not very American. No lines. No people walking up to communion. You know, they they give you an usher with a yellow and white umbrella, <laughs> so you can see high enough where someone's giving communion. And they have wooden barricades all along the aisles, and you just stand at the wooden barricade, and you just body of Christ, body of Christ, body oh of Christ, God. body of Christ, body of Christ, body, and go back. And people have to push and shove and try to get up and they're reaching because they want the Eucharist so bad it's Easter they want to go to communion and they know there are 50,000 people at the Mass not everybody gets communion it just doesn't happen uh, physically you just so they're they're all working as hard as they can to get the Eucharist on Easter Sunday um, and you know, different faces different languages um, different dress you know though you see the whole world right around you at communion and people just longing for working as hard as possible to get it uh, so that they can receive Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful and wonderful experience. Uh, not just the, being a minister of communion, but seeing the world all there gathered at the Eucharist. Yeah, I, I've often wondered when I watch one of the Masses in Rome, how do they know everybody coming forward to receive communion is is even Christian, much less Catholic? Amen. <laughs> when you say the body of Christ or Corpus Christi, if they say amen, they have made their statement of belief they go to get communion. So if they don't say amen, they don't get a host. Correct. No. Oh. Simple. It's very simple. Those are the instructions we receive uh, before Mass starts. That um, you know, make sure you, you're talking to one person and not a group of people, paying attention, and, and uh, you say amen, and you give them communion. Um, when you've got 50,000 people, that's all they do. Is amen the same in every language? Yes. Enough that you would understand it. A little different emphasis in some languages, but you know what they're saying. Passover is not the same every year. Okay. Passover.
Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. So that sets Easter, and then you go back. But Passover is always in that time someplace, but it's not always Thursday or Friday. It could be Sunday, it could be Monday, whatever the equinox is, or the, yeah, the uh, first full moon. I'm not confused anymore. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, that's why Easter is like, Easter's one of those movable feasts. And there's a whole host of other feasts that are decided when Easter is. You go 50 days out, and that's going to be Pentecost. You, know, you go uh, you know, three days back, and that's Holy Thursday. You know, so you, you just it all is set. You know, Palm Sunday is the week before, and you back up when Lent will start then. Yeah. So Easter's set by the sun, and then, and then everything works around it. And not, not all around, because there are other churches, like the Eastern churches, don't, don't do that. So you, sometimes you'll find uh, Eastern Rite Easter a week off. You know. Do the people you refuse to give communion to, do they understand, or do they... Generally, there's an instruction given uh, verbally before what, like the beginning of communion. Okay, so here we have the bread that is broken. It has been placed into the precious blood. And now we proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So the proclamation, who this is, that we will receive, the Lamb of God. And we repeat the same phrase that the centurion said in the gospel when he was sending, said, coming to get the Lord to hear to heal his son. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be you. So kind of like, this is great. This is the greatest gift we could ever receive. We acknowledge, you know, we're not perfect. We might not be perfect enough to really receive this. Lord, even though we say we're not worthy, he still comes to us. He still chooses to enter our lives through the Eucharist. And why does he do that? Because we believe we become what we eat. It's just not a calorie commercial on television. You, know, you become everything that you eat. In the Eucharist, it's the truth. You receive Christ so that you And the reception of Holy Communion. In the United States, again, this is one, remember, if you remember back, I said that there were certain things that bishops' conferences decide in the liturgy, that the red print in the book, there's certain ones that the local uh, conference of Catholic bishops in a country decides, things like gestures, when to stand and when to sit and when to kneel, are different in different countries. That's left up to the local bishops. The reception of Holy Communion is one of those things. What should be, how should people receive Holy Communion? What should be the way in which that happens in this country? So again, it's not up to me as the pastor. It's not up to us as individuals because we're a member of this faith community and the bishops who direct us then teach us how we ought to do this. In the United States, we stand. In the United States, we process up. In the United States, before we receive, we acknowledge presence of Christ in the Eucharist with the head bowed down. And then either receive our hands or on our tongue. Either way is optional. We see lots of other different things happening sometimes if you pay attention. You know, uh, but that is the direction that comes to us from the bishops on how we are to receive Holy Communion. Uh, and then we'll go back to our place. We present the body of Christ response, amen, I believe this, so be it. And remember that we use this phrase, simple phrase like this a few other times, the word of God, the mystery of faith, the body of Christ. Now remember in the old missile, you might remember we used to
proclamation of faith, and we acknowledge that faith, say we agree with it by amen. So that little piece right there. Receive communion and then go back to our places. Um, questions, Mark? Um, I usually try to make Corpus Christi Mass on Fridays, and I find it really, I get, I don't know if heartwarming is a thing, but most, almost all of the college students that attend that Mass kneel on that floor to receive it's, it's, you know, for the younger people to really take that, just, it, 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 it's just astounding. Yeah, it's interesting. You can look at that in different ways. It's in direct disobedience to the bishop. It is, uh, um, it, it basically is, it come, has been brought into the United States through EWTN that they have introduced the kneeling for communion because their religious order does that. And their they, people see the religious order doing it and they have in their mind, oh, this must be a holy word, way to do it. But that's the practice of their religious order. And so people have started doing that. They genuflect before they go to communion and then kneel down for communion. That's what their order does. But it's not what the bishops describe and ask us to do to receive communion. I've watched people fall over each other <laughs> in the communion line, literally. I was in Tennessee a few weeks ago, and they still use the communion rail. Where is this at? Where is oh. it? In Tennessee. Oh, in Tennessee. Tennessee. I mean, maybe it was just that one church, but. No, I've done it. I've seen it. It was in uh, South Carolina. It was a really old cathedral. It's beautiful. And it, just lined up. They had the communion rail there. They had the patents. But you could use your hands, so it was kind of strange. I don't know. Well, I see they do it at St. Anthony's, too, don't they? Yeah. Well, St. Anthony's is, is one of the churches that has permission to do the old-style Mass, so they would follow old rules, not this book. St. Anthony's of Temperance, uh, St. Joseph's in downtown Toledo, they have, they've been designated by the bishop to celebrate the old mass. When I see the students doing that, I look at it as they come from all over. And if it's the custom at their church where they came from, then they're just, you know, following what they did before. I mean, that's... Monsignor Metzger told us once, he said that when he was pastor at Holy Trinity, that a lady came up to receive and she genuflected and she fell and she grabbed the patent oh, and the oh, host oh, went all over. Oh, uh, oh, she God. said they, they picked them up. He said they picked them all up and nobody refused to take them after being on the floor. But that's one reason we don't do it. Uh, people fall over each other. Yeah. So it, 
you know, it's just practically speaking, they, they physically can't, but you can, unless you're in the front row. Thank you. I said, in the front row, you said, you say the body of Christ is your mistake, amen. Do we stop getting them from doing that? No, that, that's, that's an instruction for St. Peter's Square. Okay. Yeah. They're coming to a Catholic church in the United States. Father, when you were at Corpus Christi, was that family there? There's two boys and the parents, and they, I mean, the woman literally gets on her knees and bows at the priest's feet, and they do that for the host and for the cup. And I, I don't think that happened when I was there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what their nationality is. I don't know, you know why they do that. But. So, you guys know what the red print says. Yes. <laughs> yeah, question. Um, Monsignor, the Eastern Church, can you explain why they used uh, leavened bread versus unleavened bread during communion? It's part of their tradition from the very beginning. Ours has always been unleavened. And they often use a, a little cubes of bread. And they take all of the, the bread, the precious blood body, and they put it into the cup. So it's all soaking in the precious blood. And you come up to communion, the priest has the cup in his hand and a nice cloth hanging from it in his hand like this. And you walk up and you place the cloth under your chin like this. He takes a gold spoon, takes one piece of bread out and puts it in your mouth. And that's, that's the Eastern tradition in most of the, now, Granted, there are 30 different Eastern churches, so they're all, some of them are a little different, but that's the majority of them, that's how they go to communion. Yes. Yeah. Just as an FYI, we were in St. Louis, where my, one of my sons is, and they had a uh, Lebanese uh, or, or Western Rite Church that um, didn't do it that way. What they did is they had a cup and chalice that was together, and they had a little like a shot glass size of the cup, which had blood in it, and then he had the host in, in, the, in the bowl, and he would dip the host into the thing and then give to the participants, that, which I thought was interesting. That's called intinction. Intinction, when you take the host, dip it in the wine, and then receive it to people. That's That, again, is a local custom. It's not a custom we are permitted in the Diocese of Toledo, because under if you're giving communion by intinction, take away the person's right and choice to receive communion in the hand. You cannot receive intention in the hand. You have to receive it on the tongue. And so our choice in, in most dioceses is no, we'd rather have them have their choice in doing that. Wasn't there so a very dripping the whole book, the precious blood also? Oh, there's it's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You know the one thing I think about, with all the different things we've talked about, when you look at somebody doing something that you're not familiar with, and you have the one critical or criticizing thought in your mind, you have no right. You know, I never thought about that. You take away the right of somebody not to receive the blood within danger. Well, they get it with a spoon. We don't get it at all. You know yourself, in our cir circle of friends, Heart club, buddies, you know, everybody's got something to say about what someone else does. I have a question. If the host drops on the floor, is there a procedure? Because that's the body of Christ on the floor. And is there a procedure like to clean it afterwards? It should be. That's why you need a purificator and clean. Yeah.
baked, the other is, is fried, and it's, but it's the same thing, it's flour and water. just received communion and we go back to our place and uh, you'll see people some people sit and some people kneel uh, and there is no prescription on what you should do you do what you want to do in that particular moment but it does say that um,
he needs a haircut. Right. In this moment, just take that and be a moment of distress. I just thought that was funny. I always tell people when people talk to me about, you know, I get, when I, when I pray, I always get distracted. Is that a sin? I'm distracted. I can't keep my focus when I pray. And I always say to them, I think perhaps that's a little nudge from God that you ought to be praying about whatever you're being distracted. Repeat that, please. <laughs> when we we're distracted, I think that's an when the distraction perhaps ought to be the topic of our prayer. If we're being distracted by something going on in our life, maybe we should be praying about that right, right now, rather than, i got to get this last three prayers in my book, you know. Maybe so stop for a minute and pray about that distraction. And you know, ask the Lord to be with us in that distraction. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, as somebody that's lived, you know, before Vatican II and after, I did find, I still find that, thanks be to God, tough at the end. It, I don't know, it, it's, it sounds like the, the funny explanation you gave. <laughs> I know, I understand now about it, but it's still... Sure. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't flow. I don't know. It, the translation didn't work to me. Go you are sent. Daily sent us. Deo gracias. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that we have been sent. We are disciples. Try to think of it that way. We are disciples. Thanks be to God. We've received Christ. And what's the greatest job a disciple ever does is bring someone else to Christ. And that's what we're about. That's what we're supposed to do when we leave church. We got him. We gotta go share him. Thanks be to God. We have a chance to do this. Well, um, my husband and I moved from Idaho last year here. And one thing I noticed in the church there, the priest cleans the chalice, wipes the chalice in front of the people. But it's a big to-do. And they fold the cloth and put it in the chalice. But here, it is to the side. So is that a matter of choice, then? Yeah, there is no instruction that tells us to do that at the altar. In the old mass, you did it at the altar. And some people bring pieces of the old mass into mass we're using today, which is not really a correct way to do things. Um, there's a liturgical principle that tell, teaches us that um, you do what it says, you don't do what it doesn't say. Uh, because the mass has changed over time. You know, the different practices were pre-1962, and some people where priests were accustomed to those practices and brought them into the Mass after 1962, even though it's not in the Mass of 1962. This just tells us that we are to, um, when the distribution of communion is over, the priest or the deacon, or an acolyte, not a server acolyte, but an instituted acolyte, purifies the pattern over the chalice and also the chalice itself. It doesn't tell you where to do it, never think in my home to do the dishes in front of my guests at the banquet table. I would wash them at the side and at the cupboard in the kitchen. But some people do that. Some people don't have the help that we do. Or that, you know, there are other things that you could make that happen. The first time I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, did they clean the chalice? We purify it, and then the sacristans would wash it two different actions. The ritual action of purification, which is done by a priest, a deacon, or an instituted acolyte, and then the sacristan uh, washes it. Oh, I had a question about that. Last prayer, then, is that a diocese? Which um, prayer? St. Michael the Archangel. St. Michael the Archangel? Yeah. Well, it, um, it is a prayer in our diocese, and in most dioceses of the United States, but not all. Um, when it was instituted in our country, and you'll notice, I have a hymn book here, obviously, but in the back page, it kind 
part of the liturgy uh, prior to 1962. Uh, so. so why did we drop it then for a while? It's not in the book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it's there. <laughs> That's why it's at the end, after after we say go after away. mass is over, then we do it. Yes. I'm glad it's back. Other, you know, we got I, on purpose. I wanted to make today a little shorter so that you can ask any question you want about any part of the liturgy or the sacraments or something you've seen done and wonder why does that happen or why is he wearing that or I know Father Joseph did the vestments I think on his opening day with you to help you. Uh, or any other thing that you might have a question about. Yes? Um, I still have a question about the penitential rite. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know when we covered that, and I know it's in the book, that when you say through my fault, through my fault, that your venial sins are forgiven. And that was news to me. I, I mean, I don't remember ever being told that. Some people follow the readings. 
you're reading your phone during the homily, I'm coming over and I'm taking it. <laughs> but during the readings, feel free to follow along. You're at the readings. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
started that particular Gloria we're doing right now is written, so everyone does the beginning, the choir or the cantor does the middle, and everybody does the oh, end. Okay, so it doesn't, it, each person, um, each artist who writes a Gloria offers different things. When you mm -hmm. celebrate Mass in, in St. Peter's, uh, they alternate. The choir does a phrase, the people do a phrase. The choir does a phrase, that's just the way they do it there. So, because it's a long piece to sing, yeah. and so they break it up a little bit. Yeah. Father, when they change the uh, they make slight modifications to the mass uh, wording and some of the procedures 15, 20 years ago, um, I thought I was told that when we respond, and also with you, that we were to raise our hands up to the to the priest. Um, was that a direction? No, it's not. It's not in the book at all. Never was. Red print that says that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, some publishers do that, but when you were talking about the liturgical books, there's the red print and black. <laughs> Other questions? So, am I being really bad when I sing the whole Gloria? No. <laughs> I love to sing, and I know the hymn. I don't know. Go right ahead. Yeah. Good, thank you. Now, if anybody complains, I'm going to tell them you said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after going through this, we're going to be passing up.